In this video, we're going to learn about Charles Edward Stuart, known as Bonnie Prince Charlie. Bonnie Prince Charlie has historically been a very romanticised figure, a bit of a folk hero, with several songs written about him. In the series Outlander, he comes across as a complete and utter fool. So what was the truth of Bonnie Prince Charlie? Who was he? What was he like? And what did he achieve? Well, we're going to try and find out. We're going to start out by listening to the Sky Boat Song, which is a folk song about Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Battle of Culloden, the most famous battle of his life, to try and work out whether the legend around him was true. Speed, bonny boat, like a bird on the wing. Onward the sailors cry. Carry the lad that's born to be king over the sea to sky. On that day, well, the claymore could yield. Whence came the night, silently lay, dead on Culloden's field. Speed, bonny boat, like a bird on the Sailors cry, carry the lad that's born to be king over the sea to sky. Burned are our homes, exile and death, scatter the Or the sword cool in the sheath, Charlie will come again. Speed, bonny boat, like a bird on the wing, onward the sailors cry. Carry the lad that's born to be. Charles Edward Louis John Casimir Sylvester Severino Maria Stewart, that's quite a mouthful, was born on the 20th of December 1729 and he lived until the 30th of January 1788. He was the eldest son of James Francis Edward Stewart, who was the son of James VII of Scotland and II of England, who had been deposed in the Glorious Revolution of 1688. He had been king and he had been accused of overstepping the mark with how he used what were called dispensing powers. In other words, he dispensed with acts of parliament and so was considered to be autocratic. And another problem that people had with him was that he was Catholic and many members of the public and members of parliament at that period in history did not want to see a Catholic on the throne. So Bonnie Prince Charlie, as he later became known, and that's much easier to say than his full name, aimed to restore the thrones of Great Britain and Ireland and become Charles III. During his lifetime, he was referred to as the Young Pretender, with his father being the Old Pretender, and he was also known as the Young Chevalier, the Cavaliers, or Knights, of course, being the Royalist side in the English Civil Wars. He's remembered for his 1745 Jacobite uprising, known as the 45 Rebellion, and his crushing defeat at the Battle of Culloden in April 1746. And this defeat put an end to the Stuart cause. Now, there are survivors of the House of Stuart today who, if they wanted to, could aim to depose Elizabeth II, although that's pretty unlikely to happen. His escape from Scotland after the uprising has led to a romanticised portrayal of him, for example in the Sky Boat song which we just heard. 
Let's hear about the early life of Charles Edward Stuart. He was born in Rome at the Palazzo Muti, which was his family residence in Rome, on the 20th of December 1720. His father, James Francis Edward Stuart, had been given a residence by Pope Clement XI. And his father was referred to as the old pretender, as we heard earlier. So he was raised in this environment of believing that his family really had a right to the throne, that they had been cheated. And there was obviously an aim to restore their line to the throne of Great Britain. His mother was Maria Clementina Subieska, the granddaughter of John III Subieski, who had defeated the Ottoman Turks at the Battle of Vienna in 1683. So he's got a royal pedigree on all sides. He spent most of his childhood in Rome and Bologna and he was raised a Catholic. And remember, there was a law in England at the time saying no Catholic could ascend the throne and actually a Catholic couldn't marry the sovereign either and that law wasn't repealed until 2015. His family were close but they were quite prone to arguments. The family took pride in their heritage and they believed in the divine right of kings. So Charles believes that he's been born to ascend the throne. Charles's governor was James Murray who was Earl of Dunbar and he had several tutors in addition to Dunbar and became conversant in English, French and Italian. Charles had his first experience of war in 1734. His cousin, the Duke of Lyria, joined the struggle of Don Carlos for the throne of Naples and took Charles on his expedition. The 12-year-old was made general of artillery by Don Carlos and observed the French and Spanish siege of Gaeta. In 1744, the French returned their support of the Jacobites and Charles Edward travelled to France to assume command of an invasion force. The invasion of England never took place as the invasion fleet were scattered in a storm and the British fleet moved to guard the Channel. Charles's father and the Pope had introduced him to Italian society. He was quite popular in Italy and other places on the continent and expected that he would find that popularity in Britain. In 1737, James sent his son on a grand tour of Italian cities aimed at completing his education and that was quite common for young aristocrats of his generation. As I mentioned, his family was held in high regard in Catholic Italy and he was treated with respect on this tour. James had banked on foreign aid to help him recover the throne, but Charles realised that rebellion with no foreign aid might ultimately be necessary. So let's talk about the legendary uprising of 1745. Charles was named Prince Regent by his father in December 1743 with the authority to act in his father's name. So he is now the one whose job it is to claim the throne back. He had encountered many Jacobite supporters in Roman Paris and knew that there were Jacobites present in every European court. So he believed there was a lot of support for his cause. He corresponded and made plans to further his family's cause. And in mid-1745, he led a rebellion supported by the French to place his father on the throne of Great Britain and Ireland. And he raised funds to fit out warships. He landed with seven companions at Eriskay in the Outer Hebrides on the 23rd of July, 1745. The clan leaders there did not receive him warmly and he headed to Loch Nan Uve. The promised French fleet was badly damaged in stormy weather and so he needed to raise an army in Scotland and many Highland clans still supported the Jacobites and these included both Catholics and Protestants because the Stuarts had been the royal family of Scotland before Henry VII's daughter Margaret, the sister of Henry VIII, married James IV of Scotland and then after the death of Elizabeth I, James VI of Scotland became James I of England and united the realms, although not in one United Kingdom at that point. They were still two distinct countries with their own parliaments. By the time that Bonnie Prince Charlie launched his uprising, they were one country because the Acts of Union had been passed during the reign of Queen Anne. Many of the clan chiefs tried to discourage Bonnie Prince Charlie, but he gained the support of Donald Cameron of Lochiel, which gave him enough resources to start a rebellion. On the 19th of August, he raised his father's standards at Glenfinnan, thus declaring war, and marched towards Edinburgh. The British commander, General Sir John Cope, marched to Inverness and left the South Country undefended. Edinburgh surrendered quickly. Sir John Cope brought his forces by sea to Dunbar. Charles defeated the British army at the Battle of Prestepans on the 21st of September 1745. So the folk song Johnny Cope records this battle and at this point things were looking good for the Stuart cause. 
In November, Charles marched south with 6,000 troops. He took Carlisle and got as far as Swarkston Bridge in Derbyshire. Little support materialised from the English or the French though, and the British were amassing large forces, so Charles's council returned to Scotland. Much to his dismay, he didn't agree with that move. The Jacobites marched north and won the Battle of Falkirk Muir before resting at Inverness. The youngest son of the then king, George II, Prince William, Duke of Cumberland, pursued them and engaged them at the Battle of Culloden on the 16th of April 1746. General Lord George Murray had tried to warn Charles not to fight on flat, open and marshy ground, which gave the advantage to the enemy who had superior firepower. Charles basically completely ignored him. He was determined to fight this battle. He wanted his family back on the throne of Great Britain. He commanded his army from behind the lines and he couldn't properly see what was happening. He hoped that Cumberland would attack first and so positioned his men where they would be exposed to the British Royal Artillery. He realised that was a mistake and ordered an attack but the messenger he sent was killed before the message could be delivered and there was a bloodbath. The Jacobite advance was disorganised and the men charged into musket fire and cannon fire. It had no hope of success. In fact, it lasted about an hour and between 1500 and 2000 Jacobite soldiers were killed and 300 government troops. The Jacobites actually broke through the lines of the Redcoats in one area but a second line of royal soldiers shot them down and the survivors fled. Cumberland was nicknamed the Butcher by the Highlanders as atrocities were committed in his search for surviving Jacobite soldiers who when they were found were treated very harshly as were their families. Mary led a band of Jacobites to Ruffin and planned to continue fighting. Charles believed he had been betrayed and abandoned the cause. The Stuarts never tried to start a rebellion after that. James the Chevalier de Johnson, who was an aide-de-camp of both Mary and Charles, recorded events in his Memoir of the Rebellion, 1745-1746, to and that's a key historical source for the rebellion and for the Battle of Culloden. Charles's flight from Scotland is commemorated in the Sky Boat Song, which we heard, which was written by Sir Harold Edwin Bolton around a century after it happened. It was not written to be the theme tune to Outlander, just for that. Another song, Mogilamara, My Gallant Darling, by Sean Cherrick MacDonville, was also written about the Battle of Culloden, and that is an, an Irish folk song. Charles stayed just ahead of the government forces in his famous escape, heading to the Scottish Moors. He was aided by many Highlanders and nobody turned him in, even though there was a massive reward on offer, £30,000, which I can't find a modern equivalent to that, but it was a lot of money. The pilot Donald MacLeod of Galtra Gill helped him and Captain Con O'Neill took him to the island of Benbecula. Then the famous Flora MacDonald disguised him as her maid and gave him the name Betty Burke to save him and to get him by boat to the Isle of Skye. He then caught the French frigate Lerue, which ironically means lucky or happy, and sailed to France in September 1746. He actually stayed on the continent for the rest of his life, apart from one clandestine trip to London. Louis XV of France welcomed him warmly, and he was a popular hero in Paris. His brother Henry became a cardinal, thus renouncing his claim to the throne, and Charles was infuriated by this and cut off his father, who had supported his brother's decision. He never saw his father again. Bonnie Prince Charlie's escape and the Battle of Culloden are the stuff of legend, but what happened to Charles after the Rising? I mean, what did he do for the rest of his life? Well, let's find out. Charles had numerous affairs in France, including one with his first cousin, Marie-Louise de la Tour d'Auvergne, who was the wife of Jules, Prince of Guémenet. They had a son named Charles, who lived from 1748 to 1749. Charles Edward was expelled from France in 1748 under the terms of the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, which ended the War of the Austrian Succession. Charles lived for years in exile with his Scottish mistress, Clementina Walkinshaw, whom he had met during the rebellion while he was in Scotland. They had a daughter called Charlotte, the female variant of Charles, of course, who was born in 1753. Charles had developed an alcohol abuse problem after the rebellion and was difficult to live with and Clementina left him taking their daughter at the contrivance of James Francis Edward Stuart, Charles's father. 
Many Stuart supporters suspected Clementina of spying on behalf of the Hanoverian government. Whether that was a rumour or there was any truth to it, I cannot say. It seems unlikely. After his defeat at Culloden, Charles realised that a Catholic could not take the crown of Great Britain. It wasn't going to happen. So he announced that he was willing to convert to Protestantism. And that's why he took that clandestine trip to London. He took Anglican Communion in London in 1750. During the Seven Years' War between Britain and France, Charles was called to a meeting with the French Foreign Minister, the Duc de Choiseur. He didn't make a good impression as he was combative and idealistic, completely unrealistic. So that's something that is portrayed in Outlander that may actually be true. He couldn't be argued with. Choiseur intended to invade England with 100,000 men and wanted Charles to supply a Jacobite force. It was Charles's last chance to seize the British throne, but he was thwarted in a naval defeat at Quiberon Bay and Lagos. Charles's father died in 1768. Pope Clement XIII had recognised James as King of England, but he didn't recognise Charles as King. On the 23rd of January, Charles moved into his father's residence, the Palazzo Muti, where he was born, and he married Princess Louise of stolberg gedern in 1772. They moved to Florence in 1777, where he bought a residence known as the Palazzo di San Clemente, now known as the Palazzo del Pretendente, because Charles was a pretender, of course. He referred to himself as the Count of Albany and to his wife as the Countess of Albany. And that was a title given to the son of a King of Scotland. Louise left him in 1780, claiming that he physically abused her and his contemporaries very much believed her story. She was having an affair with the poet Count Vittorio Alfieri. In 1783, Charles legitimised his daughter Charlotte, whom he'd had with his Scottish mistress. He also gave her the title of Duchess of Albany and the style Her Royal Highness, although she had no right to a place in the succession, even if the succession was restored to the Stuarts. Charlotte lived with her father in Florence and Rome for five years, and she survived him by only two years and died at Bologna in November 1789. So he spent the end of his life living with his daughter. Charles had a stroke and died in Rome on the 30th of January 1788, aged 67. As Charles I had been executed on the 30th of January, his great-grandfather, the cardinals announced the date of his death as being the morning of the 31st of January because it was considered very bad luck that he should have died on the same date that his great-grandfather had died. He was buried at Frascati Cathedral near Rome and his brother Henry Benedict Stuart officiated at the service. When Henry died, Charles's remains were moved to the Vatican to lie with his brother and father. A monument to the royal Stuarts was later erected in the crypt of St Peter's Basilica, where the family are now buried. His heart remained at Frascati Cathedral. <laughs>